Four. Okay, and good morning, and the participants from China and the PhD students, welcome back. And also, uh, good evening, uh, Q, Professor Q Mo, uh, from uh, the States. So it's a great, great honor for me to introduce um, uh, uh, both the event and uh, Q, Professor Q and uh, today. So uh, firstly, uh, I think uh, 2020, uh, 22, uh, Digital Future is coming back. This is the 12th year of the event, uh, which based on uh, open uh, study and the sharing platform, digitalfutures.org. So uh, uh, we put already like 300 um, lectures on different platforms, including Bilibili and, uh, uh, and uh, YouTube. I think we try to set up a kind of uh, 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 sharing culture in the academic world because uh, we have around, for example, in China, we have around 260 universities have uh, uh, architecture department, but most of them have no opportunity to, uh, uh, to, to join the the high standard uh, prominent uh, professors like Kumo from the world, I think this will be a very useful platform for the sharing culture. So um, this year, the topic of the events is One Planet. We try to address our uh, approaches uh, based on the technology, uh, especially the digital technology. Uh, over the past few years, we make research to set up a new motivation, where we go and how to go. So. Uh, One Planet is a special topic based on the post-COVID situation and uh, including the war on the planet. So we should be thinking on the, not only the technology, but also uh, I think the mission and the vision we should set up right now. So uh, I would like to briefly introduce the events uh, in the summer, uh, including the doctor consortium, which uh, organized by Tongji and we want to sharing to the other universities. So we have 11 days, very intense um, uh, schedule, including uh, different professors we invited uh, from the world. Right now we are in the middle of it, right? To the first in the States. So afterwards, on um, the 25th of June, we will have a CRF conference. This is the fourth CRF uh, conference, computational design robot fabrication. The topic this year is hybrid intelligence. So um, um, night of um, uh, 25th of June, we will have the opening ceremony for the workshops, digital future workshops, which is extremely, um, uh, 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 extremely interesting because we have a lot of uh, around 130 workshops from the world organized by different hubs. Um, we will end it, and the whole event will closing um, at July the 3rd by some different wall of this year announced, and they will make different introduction lectures on that. Uh, at the same time, we also prepare uh, invited different workshop leaders. They uh, design different metaverse exhibition, online exhibition, I think in three different platforms and to, to introduce all the workshops uh, on this exhibition opening uh, uh, platforms. So welcome to join us in that. And this year, this is number of the workshops and uh, we have around 130 workshops and, uh, and teaching by 268 instructors from 48 countries. So it's a really big community right now. And um, uh, the most special ality this year actually is um, uh, the channels, the language channels we set up, including the coordinator of uh, English, Chinese, Spanish, Portuguese, uh, Arabic, uh, Turkish, Japanese, Korean, so on and so forth. So uh, it's interesting we have some hubs, uh, including in Shanghai, we have the original base um, uh, digital food hubs and organize different online, offline, integrate workshops. And then we have different cities around the world, in Europe, in States, uh, in India, and in South America. And, and we have different uh, uh, coordinators. They, uh, they actually organize the event, which is parallel going on. And we're sharing the opening and sharing the, uh, the online uh, platforms. And uh, this is the, uh, the sharing doctoral consortium. Um, we organize, and this session is special organized by Tongji University. 
And uh, uh, the topic is focused on the architecture philosophy, architecture theory, and the architecture design methodology. So uh, we uh, invite a lot of uh, prominent um, professors. Last week, for example, we have um, uh, Daniel Bolligen, who is uh, AI uh, expertise uh, from uh, the States. And also we have uh, Matt Thompson from CETA, um, Royal Academy of Fine Arts, Denmark. And we have uh, Li Shichao uh, and um, Ayla Berman from UVA. And also Anthony Picon from Harvard GSD uh, gave different uh, uh, interesting, uh, uh, remarkable lectures. And uh, last weekend, uh, uh, last Saturday and Sunday, we have four sessions um, uh, and a lot of uh, young um, scholars uh, gave interesting topic and discussions on advanced fabrication robotics, AI and human machine interaction, hybrid forms and the virtual architecture and uh, innovative structure and material, materials as well. So um, yesterday we invited two very special guests um, uh, Matthias De Campo from um, University of Michigan gave a special talk um, on the deep uh, 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 deep architecture, uh, uh, which based on the data dreaming and the neural networks. And uh, last night uh, we have uh, Mara Capo, who actually gave a very interesting lecture, historical uh, and theoretical lecture on the design and the mod uh, uh, automation at the end of modernity the teachings of epidemic. So let's also address um, uh, uh, to this special one planet topic uh, of DigiFusion this year. And uh, uh, we also want to announce um, DigiFusion community. This year, we start to uh, launch uh, a journal named Architecture Intelligence. And in August, you will be, uh, uh, will be start, uh, uh, will be launched on the 26th June. And uh, this journal actually guided by the scientific design thinking focus on the three future scenarios of smart habitat, virtual habitat, and the space habitat, utilize, utilizing the evidence-based architectural research methodology, architecture intelligence reconstructs the architectural knowledge system and creates an international academic platform of multidisciplines, establishing uh, a new paradigm for the sustainable development. So welcome all the researchers and PhD students and practitioners contribute uh, your research to us. So this is website, welcome. And today as great honor, we have Akumo um, who is a registered pra um, practicing architect right now. And also he is this semester, he's a visiting professor teaching MIT. I, years ago, I uh, audited his um, teaching classes in Harvard GSD. I think that's a really special memory to me. And the history is extremely interesting. Uh, today, um, the lecture is based on one of his books named Endless, uh, The Sigram Building Construction Ecological, uh, Ecology. So I would want to briefly introduce uh, Kilmo. Um, he is, um, have some practice, as just uh, mentioned. Uh, we're looking forward to see what's happening based on his theory, theory in the fu near future. And um, uh, he is teaching a uh, visiting professor at MIT this semester. He was previously the Cass Gilbert visiting professor at University of Minnesota and the uh, Garrett and Shelf, uh, Garrett Sh uh, Shelf uh, professor at uh, architecture of architecture at McNeil University and associate professor of architecture in department of, Archite uh, of architecture at recognition of his uh, design and research in, in papers. He was awarded a full, day, uh, uh, full uh, right uh, distinguisher in uh, Helsinki. Uh, the Goham Stevens Rome Prize uh, in architecture at American Academy in Rome. The Architecture League of, uh, League of uh, Europe Prize and American Institute of Architects National Young Architect Award. He has published uh, wonderful nine books, which is influenced a lot globally on architecture, including the Empire State and Building, uh, Wood Urbanism from Modular to uh, Territory, uh, Insulating Modernism isolated and non-isolated thermodynamic in architecture. Convergence, uh, an architecture agenda for 
uh, energy and thermally active surface in architecture. I think we have uh, several of them, uh, which um, is right now the, uh, in the reading list of Tongji um, graduate student courses and PhD student courses. So I think the book's really good. I strongly recommend uh, you should read it. So uh, today's lecture actually based on one of his new book uh, named Endless, uh, The Sigrun Building Construction Ecology, which presents a territorial uh, description of Sigrun Building. It, uh, it doing so, and aims to describe how humans and nature interact with the thin crust of the planet through architecture. So architecture re recognized uh, nature and society in particular ways that today uh, demand over attention and new methodology of description. In particular, the intense material energy and the labor involved in building require a fresh um, interpretation that better uh, situates the ecological and the social potential of design. Given the environmental, social, and political realities that confront us in the storms of the century, we need alter alternative descriptions of buildings and architecture and territorial activities that help us imagine how to maximize the impact of architecture on its environment in the most positive, generative, and architectural ways possible in ways that constantly uh, uh, evidence the inherent uh, solidarity, solidarity and the uh, retrocity of people, place, and political uh, and the politics involved in the building architecture. And he will argue that the enhancement of the particular building should be inextricable uh, from the in, uh, enhanced uh, of its world system and constructing ecology. A beautiful building engendered through the, uh, the uh, well, grab, well, grab, gravity of uneven uh, changes and the process of un underdevelopment is no longer a, a tenable conceit in such framework. To this end, the book makes construction ecology, material geography, and the world system analysis through architecture to help articulate all the territorial activities that engender building generally. And more specific, especially through the example of the most modern of modern architectures. So we're looking forward to see and analyze and understanding uh, uh, knowledge from the Sigram building. So let's welcome Kumo. So the screen is yours. Thank you. Great. Okay, great. Thank you, Philip, for inviting me to join this uh, event. It's very impressive what, what, what you all are doing there. Um, and I'm eager to dive in. So um, we'll, we'll get started. Ultimately, I'm going to speak about the Seagram building, of course, as you just heard about. Uh, but to get started, I want to walk through a little bit of, of what I do and how I talk about things. And um, so I'm going to bring you through a quick version of it. Um, and I, if we were in a room together, I would ask you, a, a, a give you a little quiz on, on what this is, uh, what this thing is on the screen. And, and many of you might say it's a bottle of water or it's an expensive bottle of water, et cetera. Um, but the point is, um, as you'll see pretty quickly, we don't really have a good sense of what this thing is. Um, we spend our lives in a whole series of abstractions. And especially when we get into architecture that celebrates abstractions, uh, so much, um, we really don't know what we're talking about very much these days. Um, so as architects, we might start to, you know, answer the question by measuring it, drawing it, um, trying to describe what it is in, in familiar terms. We might start to do some, you know, kind of material science analysis, figure out how much plastics, um, how much weight of each plastic there is, and there's multiple plastics in a water bottle like this. We might do some really basic ecological analysis to understand what's involved in producing those plastics from a resource perspectives. Uh, we might do some financial um, analysis to understand um, what, what that bottle of water actually is. Um, and that, in, in that case, we'll, we'll discover something you know, pretty astonishing that a, a bottle of Fiji water costs 2000 times the 
cost of tap water in, in Boston, Massachusetts, in the United States. Um, and that kind of economic uh, unevenness, that asymmetry between one bottle of water and uh, tap water of the same, the exact same material um, tells us something's going on within the kind of larger world system of this. So what I do is I tend to take things apart, whether it's a water bottle or a building, map them out, understand exactly what their physical ecology is, what that system of material and energy exchange is across the thin surface of this planet. Um, I submit that to ecosystem um, analysis. Um, so ecosystem science, uh, I use Howard T. Odom's Emergy system, Emergy with an M. Uh, which again just maps out uh, the flow of energy between all these different processes and materials in this case of what goes into making a plastic water bottle. I also do um, historical analysis to understand what we've been doing uh, as humans in this case with you know with water over a much longer period of time so back in the year 1600 if we were trying to get water in Boston um, near where I am right now we would have relied on surface water, uh, rivers, lakes, rain. Um, a couple hundred years later, we would start to, as kind of cities grew, urban agglomerations grow, we'd start to tap into larger infra scales of infrastructure. So pumping in aquifer water, lake water, reservoir water uh, from other parts of, of the region uh, to service a larger population. Uh, by the mid 20th century, we would have uh, brought in our first bottled water, which was the Perrier water from, from Europe, uh, from, uh, from France. And, um, and then today, uh, in the case of uh, the Fiji water bottle, uh, we're touching multiple content, continents, crossing multiple oceans, again, just to get water um, into people's bodies. Um, the same, it's the same ecological function through all of these historical paradigms, just the geography and the ecology is changing over time. So once we start to map out what that contemporary Fiji water bottle world system looks like, what that ecosystem looks like, uh, it really does become um, global. And uh, in this view of the earth, we can see what most of those uh, exchanges are uh, kind of fo as, fo as focused on the uh, Pacific Ocean. Um, to walk you through what that, that uh, ecosystem is, it, most of, um, well, there's water is the most, you know, significant uh, in terms of quantity, uh, but the, sec the most important in terms of uh, energy is the petroleum that goes into making the plastics. So that petroleum uh, is extracted in the Middle East. It's processed in places like um, Malaysia and Singapore um, at these refineries. Um, and then once refined, that um, material is uh, shipped to Fiji Island, where then it is turned into uh, plastic water bottles uh, and is filled with water from Fiji. Uh, and this is its the, the, you know, the kind of primary marketing claim of the company is that it's ostensibly the cleanest, purest water from this, you know, uh, fantastical island of Fiji. Um, now, uh, this explains a number of things. Uh, this is why the Fiji water bottle is, is basically square, um, as opposed to all the other round bottles that you probably have purchased. Uh, because they're with a square bottle, they're trying to pack as much water as possible onto the shipping container uh, as they're shipping it to the United States. Um, a round is a much more, you know, a, a better structural shape uh, for containing water, uh, but it, you know, obviously as a packing issue, doesn't get as much water uh, onto the shipping container um, as the square bottle does. But because it's square and it's less structurally efficient, we have to have a lot more plastic for a stronger water bottle, thicker water bottle. So there's a lot more plastic in a Fiji water bottle than the other water bottles, which is one reason for its cost, but also all of these global systems, uh, every stage has its own sort of costs. On the kind of social side of things, uh, one of the ironies is that the people who live in Fiji uh, no longer have access to the aquifer that the Fiji Water Bottle Company uses to fill the bottles of water. 
um, they have to get water from a different source. Um, so there's a kind of, you know, interesting um, uneven exchange there in that regard that, um, you know, the, the people working in that factory producing this bottle of water don't have access to that bottle of water uh, as they would have uh, prior to this uh, form of world system exchange. Once this water is uh, bottled and packaged and put on the container ship, it arrives in uh, Long Beach, California, near LA, um, and then is trucked uh, over land uh, to the northeast quarter of the quarter, corridor of the United States, where most of the Fiji water bottle uh, is um, consumed uh, at airports and train stations. You rarely see it at a grocery store because it just costs too much. Um, you need the premium of the airport uh, food stand, newsstand. Uh, to pay for it. Um, it. Back in LA is where the headquarters for this company is. It's called the Wonderful Company, the Wonderful Corporation. Uh, anything that's called the Wonderful Corporation probably is not the most wonderful thing in the world. Um, in this case, uh, you know, part of the not so wonderful aspect of this uh, world system ecology is that most of this plastic, uh, even if it's intended to be recycled, will end up in the Pacific Ocean for various reasons. Um, in this case, these are some pictures of some Fiji water bottles on the island of uh, Midway Island in the middle of the Pacific. Uh, a lot of this plastic becomes part of the Great Pacific Garbage Patch, um, which is growing every year. Um, and in this case, birds from Midway Island, these albatross birds, uh, see the you know floating plastic. It looks like food to them, so they dive down, ingest it, and after a few weeks, a few months, uh, they've ingested so much plastic that they go back to land and they die. Uh, and various photographers and scientists are documenting uh, this mixture of of bird life and plastic on this island. Now, these are the big caps. These are the type of plastic that don't uh, biodegrade in the in sun. Um, so these remain more or less um, whole. Um, and that's why they look familiar here. Most of the plastic from the Fiji water bottle is gonna degrade and become a microplastic, which is you know this size or smaller. Um, this is the type of plastic that now is everywhere in our hydrological cycle. So even the most remote, wild, you know, seemingly wild parts of the world um, now are being inundated with uh, rain plastic, uh, plastic drops in the rain drops. Um, so it's everywhere in our system and we're constantly ingesting this no matter where we're at on the planet. So um, this is the, you know, the, the ecology of that Fiji water bottle. Uh, once we have established what that is, then we submit it to different types of analysis. So here we're, we're keeping track of uh, where the fuel and the water is that goes into the Fiji water bottle, uh, how capital or dollars uh, move around uh, in this system, where it's concentrated. Um, so the water, as you can see, is extracted from Fiji, but most of the revenue from this operation is concentrated at the wonderful corporation in LA. So again, there's a very stark uh, unequal exchange uh, behind that system. Um, I won't go into all of it, but we do various historical kind of temporal forms of analysis, uh, health narrative, the technology involved in, in water bottles, um, the you know, water bottle industry in general, uh, kind of, you know, tracking how things have been pulsing over time. Uh, this, this helps us understand uh, temporarily, explains you know, what policies were in place uh, that enabled uh, the plastic water bottles, et cetera. So uh, the point is this, so when we look at something like this, um, it's seemingly simple. Um, we think it's just a water bottle, but of course it is all of these things. Um, it's these people and those birds. Um, and it's, it's enough just to say that, um, you know, a plastic water bottle is a relatively simple thing, but it still has these complex uh, world systems attached to it, right? Like it's in it, the, the appearance of that bottle of water um, is inextricable from all of these events and all of these processes occurring throughout the, the uh, thin surface of the planet. 
Um, so when we get to something like this, um, again, we could have a very, uh, historians have given us very simple answers that this is the Seagram building. It's, it's a, a bronze building by a Mies van der Rohe, et cetera, like very simple explanations of what this is. Um, but I'm going to walk you through uh, some of the construction ecology and, and world systems that are, that, that, you know, are part of this. Um, for me, this is a, a bigger kind of architectural question for me. It's not really, I mean, I, there's, there's science involved, there's, there's, you know, kind of history and uh, politics involved with this. But for me, it's a deeply architectural question to understand what a building actually is. Um, and it's one way for me to challenge, you know, one of the most unquestioned assumptions about what architecture is and what architects do, which is that no matter where I go in the world, you know, however a building is described and presented to me, whether it's in a studio, in a magazine, online, in a lecture, um, it's always within a kind of Cartesian orthographic description, um, or it's the kind of perspectival uh, equivalence. Um, and um, it seems like we can't get beyond that for some reason. Um, that we're, we're trapped in this kind of linear description of architecture, uh, X, Y, Z coordinates. Um, and this is, you know, on the kind of perspective side of things, on the upper right there is the image, the diagram of Brunelleschi discovering the kind of laws of perspective uh, in the West, um, in the Renaissance. Um, and he was able to kind of figure out how to transcribe all the kind of lines or lineaments of, uh, of a, like in this case, a cathedral and onto a, a flat surface and have an accurate kind of scientific method of, of uh, description of describing that building in space. Um, but he was very aware that uh, you couldn't capture things like clouds, things that were more amorphous, things that were moving, there's a whole set of phenomenon that he, he admitted that he could not describe through this, this method of linear perspective. Um, and it's precisely those things that have been left out of architecture for hundreds of years, things like clouds, the climate, energy, um, that now are haunting us. Uh, we have climate change. Uh, it's precisely, again, those clouds that we, we, can, we can't seem to capture. Uh, we, we put up these bad simulations, you know, we do all these um, games, but, um, but we're, we're unable as architects to articulate what the relationship is between a building and its environment, um, its climate, its atmosphere, et cetera. Um, so part of what I'm trying to develop with doing this type of work is what I describe as a, a form of nonlinear perspective, a way of, of, of looking at you know, buildings and understood, understanding them as objects. They are sort of built chunks of techno mass in the world, but trying to understand all the nonlinear ways that they appear in the world, you know, all the places and people that touch them, extract the materials, build them, uh, take them apart, maintain them, etc. that all of these uh, terrestrial activities are a part of, of what building is and ultimately what architecture should be architecting. Um, so I describe this as a form of nonlinear perspective. Um, to, to develop that nonlinear perspective, I think the most important side of it is the ecology side, the systems ecology um, method that I use, the Howard T. Odom's method of emergy, um, which is <clears throat> a way of avoiding the kind of non, the, the linear isolated way of describing a building as an object, as a, just a composition. So what do I do in energy uh, analysis is just simply track, you know, solar energy as it hits the planet, uh, moves through various terrestrial systems, you know, gets captured by the forest, drives the wind, um, drives the hydrological cycle, et cetera. All the stuff that goes in ultimately makes um, the raw material for building um, components, how those building with components get extracted and concentrated, increasingly converge um, through human processes and agency into the building itself. Um, and then very importantly, how various forms of feedback of how that material energy and information in that system through the, you know, that we learn about the building or the architects learn and how that can 
feed back into the system and make it more ecologically robust um, by making the system more and more powerful. Um, so um, <clears throat> this is the kind of general method. These are some of the kind of diagrams that we use. This is what a energy diagram of building looks like. Just, you know, again, all the inputs, you know, renewable, non-renewable inputs, all the kind of chunks and systems that go into the building. And when you do that, you end up with you know all these these very large numbers, um, which just give me a sense of the relative order of magnitude or the hierarchy of energy that's in all of those material and energy systems in a building. And once you look at a piece of architecture, a building process uh, from this ecological perspective, um, about eighty percent of the resources, earthly resources that go into building are associated with construction and maintenance, right? So, and only 20% are with the kind of operational energy loads of heating, lighting, cooling, et cetera, which have been the almost exclusive uh, focus of, of building technology and building science over the past few decades uh, when it comes to questions of energy or sustainability, et cetera. Uh, but it's from an eco ecosystem perspective, it's really the construction and maintenance, you know, how materials are produced, where they come from, how they're assembled and maintained that really tell the ecological and energetic um, story of building. Um, so that's really important. And I, I like that because architects understand materials much better than they do energy. They just don't seem to understand thermodynamics and fluid dynamics that well. So um, it's, they understand bricks and, and steel beams. So it's better to tell stories and, and develop uh, methods uh, that focus on that, uh, given their interests and expertise. So the other side of the, the methods that I use is what's called world systems analysis. These are just some examples of uh, world systems analysis from uh, Emmanuel Wallerstein, who develops uh, an early version of this. Uh, it's essentially just looking at, um, you know, not geographic political boundaries, but looking at systems, you know, like the Fiji water bottle or, you know, certain uh, material industries, et cetera. And, uh, you know, later in that discourse, uh, forms of analysis emerge, uh, such as unequal ecological exchange, uh, unequal economic exchange. So, if the United States is exchanging money and uh, for materials and energy from South America, there's always gonna be some unequal uh, nature to that, that somebody's gonna be benefiting from it, that we're gonna be concentrating materials in one place and extracting them from another, et cetera. So just looking at those exchanges and understanding them. Uh, part of that is understanding the environmental load displacements. So maybe the pollution is, is occurs you know, in some far-flung place and the, the product that is made is, is in, a, in a clean urban environment or something like that. But there's always um, environmental load displacements involved in any of these ecological uh, systems. Um, one of my favorite definitions of progress is um, uh, from Alfred Hornberg, who said that, um, what you call progress is what I call environmental load displacement. So usually every phase of, of, of what we think of as material or social progress in modernity is usually just some form of environmental load displacement. It's uh, fantastic. Um, and then finally, the, uh, the process of underdevelopment, which is the correlate of like urban development, that there's an underdevelopment process that's usually occurring in the extractive zones. Um, that are associated with that form of, of development um, elsewhere in the world. So underdevelopment is uh, the creating situations in which like an extractive zone, uh, they, they send away all of their ecological wealth um, for, in the, you know, for an inappropriate amount of uh, economic wealth in, in exchange. And as a result, um, they can't ever seem to afford to remediate their environment, uh, change their politics, et cetera, that uh, certain places become structurally underdeveloped um, through these, these kind of world system processes. Um, so um, to get back, to bring all this back to the, to the Seagram building a bit, um, there is a famous building, uh, a book written about the 
uh, Seagram Building by William White, who is a kind of a, a urban sociologist, uh, which was called The Social Life of Small Urban Spaces. And what he did was basically just turn a couple of cameras onto the plaza of the Seagram Building and see where people move, where they sit, what time of day, if it's in the shade or in the sun, et cetera. So this is an image around uh, lunch where there's a lot of people sitting on the edge where there's a kind of bench um, to the platform of the uh, Seagram building and other times of the day, there's nobody there uh, when it's in shade, uh, et cetera. And they simply use the 55 inch grid of the Seagram building as a kind of um, uh, matrix uh, spreadsheet in early spreadsheet to just figure out where people were or the number of people in each cell uh, were located. Um, so if that was the kind of social life of small urban spaces, it's a very famous uh, urban study in the United States. Um, what I'm looking at with this building or with my, my book is the social life of large urban spaces, right? So it's, it's instead of taking a kind of microscope or a camera and looking at the building, I'm taking a macroscopic view. So looking at it from a kind of planetary perspective of what that, uh, you know, again, what that building system actually is and what are the kind of social dimensions of, of that uh, building activity. Um, so as I, I've explained, we kind of explode uh, the building into all these different material energy labor systems and start to analyze it. Um, this is the second in a series of four books. The first one was the Empire State and Building Book, uh, which was a study of the Empire State Building site. Um, and so that really started in the year 1799 as Europeans began to colonize uh, the island of Manhattan. And so I'm, with these, this series of books, I'm taking a tower every 25 years from the 20th century to understand how these construction ecology systems are evolving, how the world systems of building are changing um, using these kind of icons as emblematic structures uh, to help explain and describe what's been going on with, with architecture as a, as a planetary uh, terrestrial activity. Um, so um, let's dive into it a little bit. Um, so again, it's focused on the Seagram building. Um, I picked the Seagram building because um, A, I, I have an, an immense respect for it. I've always liked it. I wanted to spend a lot of time with it and learn much more about it. Um, but it's also, you know, in some ways, the most abstract building or it's celebrated as, as a kind of paragon of abstraction. Um, and so, um, it's, it's a perfect building to therefore turn on its head and then um, analyze and describe in an extremely literal way as opposed to kind of celebrate its abstractions, usually through abstract language and abstract theories uh, as part of that celebration. So uh, when I study it in a very literal sort of way, I can use this energy method to kind of figure out exactly what the ecological content of that building is, what it, where all the materials are coming from. Um, for example, um, you know, by weight, uh, the Seagram building is, is emphatically a concrete building. Uh, about two thirds of the building's weight is concrete. Nobody thinks of the Seagram building as a concrete building, but that's what it is from a, a sheer mass uh, perspective. Um, so two thirds of its weight is concrete and about a quarter of its uh, energy or world resources are, are concrete. And there's some you know, actually beautiful um, concrete work uh, as part of this, the podium, the parking garage, underground parking garage, and uh, other parts of the building. Um, there's lots of, uh, you know, all of the steel structure is encased in concrete for fire protection. Um, and there, all of that was uh, framed uh, by hand with uh, board formed concrete. Um, so there's lots of labor. There was a whole, basically a wood Seagram building that was built and as, as form work. And then of course, dis, you know, dis, discarded uh, once it was used as, as form work. So these are the gentlemen uh, laying up the form work for those, that concrete uh, pour. Um, we often, or historians will tell us that the Seagram building is a steel building. Um, and it certainly is a primarily a steel structure in terms of its uh, 
horizontal and vertical loads. 14% um, of the weight of the building is steel and about 20% of its energy is the steel. And there's a number of kind of novel innovations um, about bolting uh, beams together rather than riveting them. Um, and um, in, in many ways, the building is a steel structure, um, but it's not, um, again, it's this, a steel and concrete structure that, that holds it up. There's other materials like travertine, which are, um, you know, I think quite beautiful in the lobby and the elevator lobbies of the building that are quite insignificant from an ecological and, and, and uh, material perspective. Um, same with some marble panels that are uh, lining the elevator cores um, that replace the, the glass uh, and the solid parts of the building. Uh, rarely seen, rarely discussed uh, as part of the building. It, it's just, it's quite astonishing to see uh, that those marble slabs in the, in the uh, envelope. Um, what's talked about most with the Seagram building perhaps is the so-called bronze envelope. Historians always uh, tell us that this building is a bronze building. It's not a bronze building, it's a brass building. Uh, and I think that's important because Brass and bronze have very different world systems, very different ecologies, very different energetics. If it was actually bronze, I think it was something like three or four times as much energy would be in, um, in that envelope, uh, the, the skin of the building. Um, but what's very interesting about this is, uh, even as a brass envelope, is that it's less than 2% um, of the building's weight, uh, but is almost half of the building's energy. So of all of the resources that go into this building, half of it is going into this, this brass envelope. Um, and here you, you can see it's quite you know early on and it's um, processing, um, it's clearly a brass um, material uh, that is stained uh, to look like bronze. Um, and this is you know for, again, historians who tell us that Mies is a kind of purist or has a kind of idea about truth and materials or something like this. This is a kind of revelation to see uh, this brass material being stained to look like it's bronze, um, which is an ac activity that goes on well into its, its maintenance that I'll come back to in a minute. Um, so when we look at all the materials of the Seagram building, and by the way, this, what's involved in this is from a method point of view, is building an incredibly accurate Revit model of all of these material systems so that we can keep track of every bolt, every you know, pound of concrete, et cetera. Uh, in this case, just weighing what um, those different materials are, uh, or uh, here they're aligned in terms of, organized in terms of the energy content of each of those materials. And just some very basic analysis that I'll do early on is just to look at the, the mass to energy ratios. Um, and again, that, as I mentioned, the ratio between the kind of amount of energy that goes into the small amount of, of brass in the building is really striking. And I know that there's a whole set of uh, forms of world of systems analysis to do given that. Um, so I'll jump into it, um, you know, we'll, we'll We'll be looking first at the, the brass um, and where it's coming from. Mostly uh, we'll be looking at um, the copper uh, that goes into the brass, which is the primary material uh, for the, the brass envelope uh, system. Uh, in this case, a lot of the brass came from a mine in Chile. Um, this is you know after World War II. So um, the South America being one of the continents that's you know less untouched uh, by World War II was a source of, uh, of industry um, after the war. Um, so in the case of Chile, the, uh, the, the mines in Chile are the result of, of the geology of, of uh, South America. Um, and this is where I always note that, that all architecture is geology before it's anything else. Um, so in any of these materials tracings that I do, I always go all the way back to their kind of geological origin because um, you know, it's whether it's a metal coming out of a mine, whether it's a wood beam that comes out of a forest, uh, the soil determines the, what trees grow in a, in a particular forest. 
and the geology determines what the soil is in any given forest, right? So there, even a, a wood beam is geological. Um, in this case, we have two uh, continental plates that are sliding by each other. Um, so one plate of the lithosphere sliding by another. And uh, as they do so, they, they create a lot of friction and heat up uh, a number of metallic elements, in this case, copper, uh, which leach up through buoyancy and, and through pressure um, and through the cracks of the continental crust of the Andes Mountains. And as they uh, cool, uh, they start to fill in these cracks and, and start to create these pools, these porphyry deposits, which is what um, humans then mine out of the ground. Um, so this is a kind of geological section, composite section of, of different mines and, and places of production that were involved in the Seagram building. We'll be looking at the first one there, the Chiquicomata mine, at the Anaconda mine in, in, in Chile, uh, which started very early. It was just you know a kind of small uh, mine um, started by the Guggenheim brothers um, in 1919. Uh, and it was a, you know, the, and by the way, the, the uh, Atacama Desert is the driest place on the planet. So the working conditions here are pretty severe. Uh, hasn't rained there for quite some time. Uh, but over time, they set up a full factory. Uh, of course, there's uh, lots of uh, stories to tell about the, the people who work in this very dry place, what it's like for families, so what kind of uh, urbanism they have there, what life is like there. Um, historically, this is, um, you know, before uh, the, the Seagam building extraction, and this is what the Chiquicamata mine looks like today. Um, it's the largest uh, mine, uh, it's the largest hole that humans have dug, uh, it's several miles wide, a few miles deep, um, and it's, you know, the smallest little specks you see on these roads cutting down into the mine are, are some of the largest pieces of equipment that we'll see in a minute that we, that humans have produced. Um, so it's, um, when we zoom in here, you can see that like some of these trucks are, you know, like these size trucks. So it's, it's, it's hard to understand the scale of this place. Uh, but, but humans have been mining uh, this particular hole for over 100 years. Um, and as they do that, they pull out uh, a, a load of, of ore from, uh, in a truck like this, and they might get one, two, three percent of copper out of, uh, out of that type of load. Most of what's going to come out of that truck are, are what is known as tailings, um, and the tailings are just rock that's dumped uh, once the copper has been extracted. And so they have a whole set of systems for how to dump these tailings. So these are, this is a kind of big fan uh, system that they've produced. Uh, so this is, you know, miles long to, to dump these rocks. Uh, it's kind of beautiful, kind of horrifying. Um, but uh, about 10 years ago, they had the, the company, mining company had to decide if they were gonna uh, move the tailings or move the town because they needed the space uh, for the tailings. And they decided to build a new town and displace all of these people and their lives uh, to a new town uh, so that they could continue to dump these tailings. And as you can see there uh, on the north uh, part of the town, the tailing mountains are starting to overtake the town in a, in a literal sort of way um, and are starting to crush um, what this town, like, which is now a ghost town, um, literally starting to crush the houses uh, and, and other structures of the miners who pulled out that ore and produced those tailings. So again, this is a, you know, kind of a very literal, fairly dramatic um, representation of, of one of these, you know, forms of an equal exchange that uh, the kind of, you know, one side of the system is literally crushing the other side of the system. Um, I'll just leave it at that. There's there's a whole set of you know historical figures that have gone through this town. Uh, che, uh, the South American social activist and political organizer, actually spent time um, in um in the you know mid 50s uh, when the Seagram building copper would have been being extracted. Um, so there's some interesting kind of um, social historical narratives uh, that I, I elaborate on in the books. But we would get the copper out of this mine, uh, as well as other mines in the US, like the Anaconda mine in, in Butte, Montana. 
and uh, that would go into producing uh, a brass billet, um, which would then be heated up and pressed through a whole series of dyes to produce, in this case, the, the mullion, the famous mulligan, mullion on the Seagram building facade. Um, so that's done through physical brute force. In this case, there's a gentleman uh, with a pneumatic hammer ramming that mullion through the die uh, um, to give it its final shape. Um, this is a very rough process. Um, and when the brass comes out of uh, this machine, out of this process, um, it's actually very you know, warped and it's anything but straight. Um, uh, historians, uh, including Mario Capo, who he had <laughs> uh, lecturing recently, uh, described this building, and Seagram building, as a monument to industrialization and, and, a, and a monument to standardization, as the quote he uses. Um, but it's anything but standardized. I mean, this is a, a very hand handicraft building. Uh, so this is a, a, a Polish gentleman who, in Chicago, was charged with straightening every one of these mullions. So you can see his jig that he's there, and he's pounding on this with a hammer trying to straighten it out um, into a perfectly straight uh, beam. Uh, and, and here, you know, eyeing it up to see if it's straight and square. Um, so it's very much a hand building. I mean, there's obviously some machine processes involved, but whether it's the, the brass, the glass, the stone, all of these are very much hand um, manipulated uh, objects. It's very much a kind of arts and crafts building in that sense. Once those brass beams are um, straightened up, they're then dropped in a chemical bath. Uh, it doesn't matter if it's hearing protection, um, you know, air protection. There's the, none of these workers are wearing any of that protective uh, gear. Um, so again, these are kind of demonstrations of, of unequal exchanges that are involved with building. Um, they're here. They're um, cleaning various process oils off of the, the brass beams, uh, cleaning them up, uh, stacking them. Here, one of the most beautiful images, I think, of modern architecture possible, uh, stack of the Seagram building uh, I-beams. Um, and they're going to ship, um, once they've been produced here in Chicago, they're going to ship these uh, beams to Long Island, New Jersey, where they're going to be assembled with uh, several other uh, brass components that were produced elsewhere in the United States uh, to produce like the famous uh, corner detail uh, and other parts of the envelope. So there's lots of other smaller little pieces of, of brass uh, profiles that go into the brass envelope of the Seagram building. So you can see that some of those were produced in Ohio, Chicago, Massachusetts, et cetera, but they all converge in Long Island uh, and just outside of New York City, where they're assembled and put together. Those smaller components are assembled into the building envelope systems. Um, this is where all the corners were welded together to be nice and straight. Um, and, um, you know, there's various forms of advertising at the time about uh, the production of this building. Um, so they're again being cleaned here they're being stained you can see the brass i-beam there uh, in the background um, as it's being stained in the foreground um, all those components be you know kind of taped together um, weatherproofed um, so here you can see them uh, pressing the waterproofing in and then uh, heating it up and caulking it into place uh, sealing up that spandrel panel into the other uh, brass uh, extrusions. Uh, this is also an opportunity where they would um, water test those joints. Um, so here they, they have an old aircraft engine from World War II that they would spin up and blow water on to mimic hurricane forces and test for uh, leaks. Uh, so Mies is on the outside. Um, talking to the owner of this company while his project architect is on the inside looking for any leaks. Um, all those panels are assembled, they're shipped in, you know, the Midtown Manhattan. Um, they're bolted on to some anchors that are uh, uh, welded and, and bolted into the concrete frame. Um, and those, you know, first panels are installed uh, from, from the outside in. So they put up the mullions first, 
and then uh, which are two stories tall and then uh, individual height, one story height um, uh, brass mullion frames, uh, some of which had to be modified on site, but uh, relatively little of that. Um, so this is just the kind of assembly of, of that envelope um, and it's a inspection on site. So here, you know, we've seen the steel, we've seen the concrete and here we have the brass rising up um, and uh, producing the, the, the appearance of the building as we know it. Um, it doesn't end with this, you know, the, the end of construction. Uh, the, the ecology continues on in the form of maintenance um, so this building is in the same way that every inch of that brass was hand rubbed uh, and stained to look like bronze. Uh, it occurred, this recurs every single year. So every square inch of the, the brass is uh, stained every year to, to look like bronze, to sort of clean it up and maintain its bronze appearance. Um, so that's the brass. Uh, we have the, the glass as well. Um, uh, very interesting story. I mean, the Seagram building is, is well known for the, the kind of brass bronze envelope as well as the, the kind of amber hue of the, the glass uh, system that's in the upper part of the tower. Um, and it's, it's quite famous because it all, it, it makes allusions to the um, amber colored liqueurs, liquors that the Seagram building sells, produces and sells, and that you know, created the capital that was necessary to build this building, which was the most expensive building ever built at, at its time. Um, so the kind of special color of this glass was not available um, outside of you know, custom uh, production. And there's only one company that was willing to take this on in the end. Uh, and because of the production method involved, it could only be single layer glass. So it's not insulating glass. And this is part of the reason that the uninsulated uh, brass envelope and the single pane glass uh, make one of the least energy efficient buildings in Manhattan by far, by orders of magnitude. Um, but we have the kind of color that Mies wanted of, of both the bronze, you know, the stained bronze and the, the glass. Um, so the glass um, begins, again, it's, a, it's not a, you know, an industrial process uh, in, the, in a you know, 20th century sort of sense. It's much more of a medieval process, um, in this case called the pot method. So they take all of the chemicals and elements that are necessary to make that color of glass and they heat it all up in these kilns. Um, and this is all occurring in, in Western Pennsylvania, just a couple hours outside of New York City. Um, and they heat up those materials and then they pour them onto a cast iron table. So here we see the, the, the pot in the back with the, the vat of, of glass material and it's liquid, it's hot, so it's liquid. So it's running down this table and then out onto these cast iron tables that are on tracks and move very slowly and, and draw the material out into what then becomes a glass uh, sheet. So it comes out, it, the glass, the iron table keeps moving. Uh, they can cut it into sheets as it's coming down um, onto these beds. And um, they, they move the whole uh, cast iron table um, out into a, a kind of cooling uh, part of the factory where the glass cools and it gets some strength and, and rigidity. Um, and here's the end of the, the, the pot that we saw poured. Um, so all of this occurs in the standard plate glass uh, factory in Butler, Pennsylvania. So that's the the casting hall there, uh, you can see all the vats and the uh, casting tables. Um, once that glass is drawn out and cools, it's then taken into the, the grinding and polishing hall, uh, which would have looked like this, uh, basically very large discs um, that they're spinning the, the glass sheets around. And uh, this gentleman in the foreground is dumping various uh, kind of sizes of, of sand um, into that to, to grind it down to a certain thickness and then to polish it uh, at the same time. Um, uh, again, large chance for breakage. So there's a lot of extra glass that's produced. Um, 
And then once that glass is polished, they cut it to size, sorry, cut it to size and then ship it from the uh, container uh, facility uh, at the top of this image, which is next to the railroad track. Um, so this is the, the site of the, where the factory was. Um, the, the kind of most dramatic uh, uneven exchange story in the book um, is the glass. Um, this was um, Western you know, Butler, Pennsylvania was, uh, you know, an industrial, industrial town. Uh, most of the people who lived in the town worked in either a, a train factory, which closed in the 1930s. Uh, so by the 1950s, when this glass was being produced for the Seagram building, uh, most of the population was working in the glass factory. Um, because the, this company and factory took on the production of this glass for the Seagram building, it was not able to um, transfer its the fixed capital of the factory into an alternative method, which the other factories did during the same time that the glass for the Seagram building was being produced. So they all took on the new uh, production facilities for the, the Pilkington float glass um, production method, which is how any architectural glass today is made is through float glass production. Um, the standard glass company missed that opportunity, basically missed the so-called window as it were uh, for that, that production system. And so when they were done producing the Seagram building uh, glass, uh, they soon went out of business afterwards. Um, and so this sent the whole town of Butler, Pennsylvania into its Rust Belt uh, economic condition, its, its uh, Rust Belt depression. Um, for decades, and it's still um, struggling as a town in, in the Midwest uh, on account of this. Um, so after the factory closed, it eventually burned and became a brownfield site. Um, and when we look at where the factory was located uh, in the 1980s, you can see that it was redeveloped as a, as a park. Uh, there's some low income housing, there's housing for elderly, and then play facilities for children on this former uh, factory site. Um, and that might seem like a good thing or a positive evolution of the urbanism there. And to some degree it is, um, but um, there are a number of, of chemicals left over from this factory. They didn't clean it up fully. Um, they kind of just paved over it, gra and put grass over it. And there's uh, still pathways for arsenic and other chemicals um, in some of these most vulnerable populations. Again, the lowest income population, the children, the elderly, uh, these all have the kind of significant vectors to these factory chemicals. Um, so this whole town changed once this uh, factory went away and uh, became this, this park. Um, so these are some of the kind of, uh, it's, it's a basically a state uh, environmental protection site uh, because of the arsenic and other uh, chemicals that are uh, found in and around the park area. So uh, if you went there today, it would look quite benign, normal suburban park uh, in America, uh, but there's a kind of very intense history of unequal exchanges going on between this place and Midtown Manhattan with this, this beautiful building. Um, I'll just go into it just briefly. I'll be a little bit more brief about a couple of the other systems. Uh, granite for the, the paving of the plaza, again, is a small amount of material, small amount of natural resources going into that stone uh, for this, this kind of pink granite stone of the famous Seagram Building Plaza. Um, but it's still such an important part of the building that I, I did tracing uh, for it, uh, which came from a uh, quarry, a, a quite small quarry in the state of Maine, um, a few hours north of, of Manhattan, um, which this is what it looks like today. Uh, it's, it's very small, it's just a few acres uh, in size. In the mid 1950s, when the Seagram building blocks were being cut, um, this is what it would have looked like. Um, so it's a very kind of rural place, uh, very low tech, uh, just a few people working uh, in this quarry at any given time. And um, as part of uh, the granite story in the book, 
Um, I, I really focus on a single family. Um, so this is one of the gentlemen in this picture um, had a family who lived in a house that was on the site of the quarry. Uh, and as, you know, as much as a story about their history of their family as it is about the, the granite itself, um, again, there's still plenty of unequal exchanges that occur between, you know, this extraction site and the, the you know, pavement of, of Midtown Manhattan. Uh, but these individuals, this family was, they felt very, they're very proud. They're very happy. Uh, they enjoyed growing up there. It was very hard work. It was very, you know, they were very poor, uh, but they still made significant contributions to their uh, their, you know, city and their, their country. Um, they're, so they're very proud people um, who lived and worked um, at this quarry. And this is what it looks like. This is some of the kind of infrastructure and techno mass that's left there. Um, it's still an active quarry. They do pull out new stone uh, that they cut up. Uh, there's still piles of 55 inch square Seagram building uh, pavers uh, around the quarry that are to be found. Um, and as I mentioned, um, you know, from an operational energy point of view, that the, the Seagram building is one of the worst buildings in Manhattan. Um, you know, most buildings, they have an energy score, energy star scoring system from zero to 100. Most buildings are 80, 90, uh, most contemporary buildings, even a you know, Trump Tower. It scores in the 80s and 90s, uh, the towers that he's done in, in New York City. Um, the Seagram building scores has a score of three um, out of 100. So it's it's a really, again, super inefficient envelope. Uh, lots of, you know, basically just fuel um, going into this building to keep it warm, to keep the lights on, um, et cetera, or to cool it in the summer. Um, so um, just a note to say that there's a huge amount of fuel going into this building, which I spend a little bit less time on. Um, uh, sorry. Um, so there you have it. You have the Seagram building as, as you may know it, as the kind of icon of abstraction and of, of modernity. Um, this is the famous Ezra Stoller photograph of the Seagram building. Um, and in very much in every sense, it's a trophy building. There's, it's a trophy building in the sense that uh, the trophy is a, is a real estate term, real estate jargon for the kind of highest end of type A office space. So this, this building commands some of the highest rents in New York City. Um, so it's a kind of a trophy in that sense. Uh, but I also think of it in the kind of ancient Roman sense that uh, when a Roman army would go invade somewhere. Uh, they would, you know, when victorious as they generally were, would bring back the spoils of war, all the kind of material, energy, gold, whatever it might be, um, all of which were described as trophy. Um, and very much, you know, this is what's going on with this. The architects designed a building and people went out and extracted these materials in my mind in the kind of war of, of architecture. Um, bring back the spoils of all, you know, the brass and the glass and all these materials and concentrate them in midtown Manhattan. So it's very much a kind of trophy in that uh, ancient Roman sense. Um, but it's also trophic in the ecological sense that there's, um, you know, different layers. There's a hierarchy to this uh, construction ecology and this, all of these materials being concentrated in midtown Manhattan you know, puts this building at a very high trophic level in this construction ecology. Um, so there you have it. We have a, a trophy in midtown Manhattan and we have atrophy in uh, the periphery, right? So the miner's house getting crushed by the, the, the tailings or the, the, in the West, you know, Butler, Pennsylvania town falling into a, a rust belt depression uh, on account of the glass production for the building. So we have, you know, a trophy building and atrophy in other parts of the world. So it's, you know, buildings don't just happen, you know, from nothing, they, they only occur through all of these systems. And it would be my argument that if we wanna make uh, what we think of as a beautiful building, that we have to design all of these world system processes or to, you know, for the purposes of their lecture series, you know, thinking of this as one planet, thinking of, of, of this as one set of, uh, terrestrial processes that produce a building. And, and the best 
possible outcome for me would be that we would develop a beautiful building that then also has beautiful, you know, uh, production processes attached to it that, that, that uh, or the other way of seeing that is that you can't just make a kind of beautiful object that, you know, that you designed as an architect and not care or not be aware of what all of the world systems and ecologies are that go into making that, that it's that if those processes are vulgar as they are in the case of the Seagram building, then I think of the building as, as a vulgar building, as beautiful as I think the Seagram building is, I can no longer say it's a beautiful building because as a world system, it has all of these forms of uneven exchange. So um, this tells me a lot about a, as a practicing architect about how to think through uh, designing not just the building, but the whole system of production that goes into it, you know, where the materials are coming from, what those materials are, who's pro processing them, how are they paid, what's their wages like, what are their living uh, qualities of life like, um, et cetera, that all of that, that kind of reciprocity between the building as an object um, and the building as a world uh, terrestrial system need to be developed with equal rigor, otherwise it will not be successful architecture in this century. Um, so again, a lot of that comes from a much more literal description of what architecture is, uh, rather than indulging our kind of forms of abstraction. Um, and just to finish up, um, if Mies said that God is in the details, I don't think he was ever a very secular, or sorry, a very theological uh, architect. Um, today, we would say that Gaia is in the details of those details, right? What are the world systems and e ecological details of those uh, uh, constructions? So um, I'll leave it there, Philip. I hope I'm, I'm near or on time, and I'm, I'm happy to take any questions from, from the students or others who are joining us today. Fantastic. Uh, it's a great lecture. <laughs> I think uh, we make uh, the really right option to invite you to make this special speech, which is tried a good uh, response. Uh, uh, it's a feedback from to the, uh, the to the topic and theme of uh, digital futures one planet this year. It's a wonderful lecture and uh, have a lot of re remarkable uh, point, uh, which is quite interesting. It's like a, a tale from the Fuji bottled water to the Seagram building and uh, tracing the uh, carbon footprints of the, this uh, historical building in uh, Manhattan. Actually, uh, we, it's like a very interesting story to tell us uh, initial background from everyone learn uh, uh, modern architecture know the details of Sigram facade uh, for these corners and uh, the, the curtain wall system. But uh, actually today uh, you, you put forward another idea as the last image, the details of the details. So that is a lot of uh, uh, perspective uh, scenarios and that really gave us a ethical uh, rethinking on the meaning of design. I think it's quite remarkable uh, for us too. I think it's the book, I'm looking forward to, 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 to read your book. Uh, this is this is very 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 uh, I think uh, 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 it's kind of enlightenment to the the new um, uh, paradigm shift and uh, we should be thinking uh, in this uh, after uh, I think in the in the post COVID time. So we have some questions, uh, which is uh, a lot of things. Uh, maybe you can have feedback. And uh, you are talking about the the world system uh, actually. It's not just about the, the building object itself. Uh, so the building, something hidden behind is uh, like a, a, a global thinking, especially with some historical perspective because this is a building built in the 1930s, 30s, in the 1930s. So uh, I think it's a long time ago, almost uh, 100 years. So I, th I think it's an interesting historical uh, 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 research as well. And to looking into the uh, the building from uh, elements, I think it's just like Ram Kuhas in the uh, Venice Bernalli to 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 subdivide the building to a lot of elements. So you actually um, uh, 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 putting forward uh, the most uh, interesting to me is you talk about the the, uh, 
the material not bronze, uh, it's brass. And so it's, it's quite remarkable about the uh, energy and the mass and energy, the percentage that is really interesting to me to rethinking on um, uh, when we make option of design, when, when we're putting forward uh, the ideas and also we uh, focus on uh, the object itself, design uh, wonderful details. And uh, maybe this kind of remarkable uh, feature for, for this building is actually from this material, uh, this, this copper looking material from outside of the building and including the, the lighting at night. I visit several times from outside, but uh, never uh, go see. <laughs> but I, I think uh, uh, it's interesting you, you, you analyze the energy uh, uh, of these materials, especially the, the brass, I think. And also we, we can see a lot of interesting parks surrounding Boston, uh, including Boston, not just uh, the, the west of Pennsylvania. Uh, this kind of the parks actually is from the, the formal uh, factories, and I think uh, the uh, the renovation of the, uh, the the landscape and the field actually is also a very interesting story, a, a tale of these buildings. So uh, so that's wonderful. I think we have a lot of very strong impression from that. So uh, I think it's some scientific point, and maybe my question goes to your methodology to reading in this historical building. Actually, it's based on the, the carbon footprint. So when we uh, want to calculate this kind of uh, carbon footprint, do you think this kind of uh, uh, element-based uh, method, uh, uh, maybe from the material perspective, uh, the main materials we implement in, in these buildings is the right way. Is, uh, is that uh, any uh, thinking on this, how to subdivide the building and how to tracing this kind of uh, carbon footprint? Normally in the new design process, uh, do you have any suggestion from a methodology perspective of your research? Yeah, from, uh, I, you know, for kind of in contemporary terms, well, I think it, it it's the same the same answer for contemporary or historical method methodology. Um, I, I do emphasize the use of ecosystem methods again, like this energy method from Howard T. Odom, um, and because it has the best um, system boundaries. So, uh, if you compare this ecosystem science method um, to something like LCA, like life cycle assessment. Um, there's a big difference between them because of, in terms of their system boundaries, like what they are including uh, and what they're calculating. Life cycle make it sounds like it's everything that would be involved in the cycle of that entity or that material. It's not, it's not true. Um, life cycle assessment keeps track of all the energy and dynamics that would be involved once humans have extracted the material, right? And then they keep track of whether it's carbon or you know global warming potential or whatever it might be, um, and that's great. It's better than just analyzing the ener energy of a building or the fuel dynamics of a building. What the ecosystem science gives us is a, expands the system boundary definition to include, you know, all the work, you know, the you know, kind of work of the planet, right? So what are the the biogeophysical uh, factors that go into making stone or making a you know, copper or making a, a timber beam, right? Or the sand that goes into the glass, right? So if we wanna think about truly kind of sustainable systems, then we have to be thinking about how our extraction and production uh, practices synchronize with the things that the earth does. Um, LCA doesn't tell you anything about that. It just tells you how much pollution we're putting in or whatever. So, um, using the ecosystem method is, is very important. There's a really critical distinction from a system boundary perspective between energy and something like LCA. And you can see what's happening in the kind of in building science is that in, for good reasons, they keep expanding their system boundaries, that they realize that they're, you know, for years we were just keeping track of how much energy it takes to heat and light a building or something like that. Now, I think there's a good understanding that we have to keep track of the carbon and the carbon's not just 
of, of what it takes to operate the building, but what, what it takes to build the building. And, and so every few years, you see a, a kind of slight expansion of the system boundary. At some point, they're going to arrive basically at the ecosystem methodology, right? The energy methodology, once they get their proper system boundaries defined uh, in the right way. Um, so I'd say just jump ahead to that, right? Like there's no reason to spend time on LCA and these other things, because I, I, I think we need to just uh, start working on the proper system boundary uh, with, with the kind of ecosystem definition of a building. So that's the same for, uh, that's the same answer for kind of the historical study, but I only do these historical studies, Philip, for me to help understand how I want to be practicing as an architect today. So it's also a speculative method. It helps me learn how to analyze systems that I'm thinking about for my buildings. Um, um, so it, you know, it's it is the same method, just you know, one's projective and one's kind of historical. Um, so I, you know, I do use this type of analysis in my design practice uh, early on to figure out what material systems might I might use for a given site for a particular location, um, and to figure out how. I do a lot of uh, timber buildings, a lot of wood buildings. So um, I, I can, I, at this point, say that I, I know how to make uh, a building, and hopefully it's a good, beautiful building, but also with good forestry practices that regenerate the forest, help rebuild the soil, you know, by targeting certain species and, you know, harvesting trees in certain ways. So um, you know, we're designing, you know, that whole process as much as we're designing the building itself. And that in, in my mind there, you know, we're starting to achieve what, you know, one hopes uh, this, this, or what I'm asking us to do in, in these books, which is, you know, kind of design the reciprocity to, between um, architecture and what it takes to build architecture. Um, so in that sense, I, in many cases, I just say I'm designing building because building is all of those terrestrial processes and the object, right? Um, exactly. So, yeah. Yeah, I think um, it's a very uh, interesting research method. I think I, I, from your books, you write a lot of books. Uh, we can learn not only the building technology part, you have a lot of um, very interesting perspective from not only the historical perspective, but also this kind of ethical, uh, evaluation and uh, which is remarkable to the con uh, contemporary education uh, pedagogy. So that's your contribution. I also remember, I think it's two years ago, you published a paper on the log, LOG, uh, uh, a linear, nonlinear, linear perspective. Um, I read that paper carefully. Uh, it's quite interesting to talk about some other aspects we should take in count in the design process, including you mentioned like the cloud uh, in the perspective vanishing point joins, there is something more than the geometry. Uh, and that kind of unlinear is, uh, I think it's a, a totally new uh, analyzed uh, uh, the design methodology and thinking methodology. Could you uh, briefly adding something on this unlinear uh, perspective of, of your uh, research and design and thinking? Could you talk about that? Yeah. So I was trained, you know, to think in linear projection, orthographic projection as an architect, as we all are. Um, and, you know, what it has occurred to me is that by using uh, this method, this, you know, energy method and the world systems method, is that I, I do start to understand it as a nonlinear description of a building, right? Because I'm I'm thinking about geology at the same time I'm thinking about this, this corner detail as I'm thinking about the economics of Western Pennsylvania or whatever. It's like, it's very nonlinear, like all the relationships I'm, I'm tracking, um, but they're, they're hold, held together in a kind of coherent space of those ecosystem diagrams, right? Like all these things, they, they, that's where it becomes kind of linear again, because they're all the kind of dots are connected, but it's a very nonlinear system and it's, um, and what you start to develop as an intuition in the same way that you develop intuitions about geometry and space as an architect in a system of linear perspective. And as an ecologist, you can start to develop a, a sense of, of what things are going to impact each other or what's going to have more impact or whatever. So when I see that brass 
is 47% of the energy. I just know that that's going to be a big part of the story, right? So you start to develop some sense of what the hierarchies are in that nonlinear uh, perspective description of a building. And um, I don't think I've had any success yet uh, in my seminars that I teach now. I, we're usually trying to work through some nonlinear perspectives of buildings, like trying to think about what that is from a design perspective. It's pretty hard, um, but it's it's conceptually it's very clear. Uh, and and but I think it's it's very necessary, right? It's we're so good at, at kind of orthographics and perspective drawing and modeling and architecture. You know that that's our expertise, but we we know how to do that. We don't need to like you know have endless debates about which system's better or what drawing is better. We need to start to incorporate all these other factors, whether it's the economy, the climate, whatever it might be, uh, given your own interests. Um, how do you start to make a kind of less linear uh, description of a building um, than what perspectival you know space gives us? Um, I mean, when you kind of take a step back and look at it, what we're doing, it's so reductive, right? You know, just obsessing over the kind of geometries, et cetera. It's super interesting, but it's not the only thing involved in architecture. And it's not the only thing going on in the century. And arguably maybe not the most important things that are going on in the century can be asked, asked or answered with geometry, um, as important as geometry might be. So, Developing an architectural agenda for, for this nonlinear perspective, I think, is is one of the bigger kind of questions or topics in architecture right now. Is like how do you how do you associate these the salient environmental political phenomena of this century with with building materials and geometries and all that sort of stuff? How do we create a space, uh, a design space that includes all of that? Um, it's it's rather than just tacking it on and just saying our buildings are green or whatever at the end and just keep doing what we've been doing for the last couple hundred years um, through our training. So yeah, it's a, it's a pretty big, huge topic, um, but I think it's in some ways the only topic uh, in architecture right now. Good, very interesting. Sigrun building, as we mentioned uh, in the book, is uh, just like uh, your introduction is a, um, Monument of specialization should be extremely uh, industrial uh, process. But uh, in your lecture, actually, learning is quite handy, as you mentioned. It's handmade and also including the crafts um, at that stage in the history. So, uh, my discussion today, when Mara Couple coming, he actually Well, from your actual learning, how to tracing this kind of carbon footprint uh, to analyze if this kind of uh, localized uh, digital uh, factory or digital uh, 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 craftsmanship can contribute more to the future eco ecology, urban ecology, and the building ecology. I think uh, it's, a, it's a remarkable uh, knowledge and the research method methodology from your lecture, and uh, really, really uh, uh, attractive and, uh, and impressive. I think um, uh, also you have a book on the timber. I think that's also a very interesting book. Maybe we should invite you again to make um, another lecture <laughs> on the timber design and also uh, another book I remember uh, about the installation and the non-installation system of uh, different buildings is, is quite uh, interesting from all these details actually you can read into the history of the categories and also the uh, environmental performance which will uh, how to influence the architecture design we have we should invite you more often to give us uh, more lectures i'm looking forward i think it's quite quite fantastic and remarkable of your research, uh, uh, it's, it's, it's really uh, wonderful to have you. So I think, uh, do, Chao, do you have any student from, from the students or YouTube platform? Chao? And also we have Professor Zhang Jiawei, uh, who is um, also very good at a historical in the building technology. Uh, Professor Zhang, would you like to ask some question?
Welcome. I see you turn on your, uh, your phone, but no voice. Cannot hear you, Jiang. Jiang Jiawei, um, do you have any question to put forward? I cannot hear you. in German and um, uh, including some concrete uh, mass concrete system um, of the building technology, which is quite interesting. Uh, I don't know, maybe some, some problem with his phone. <laughs> yes. Chao, do you have any question? Looks like he has a, he sent a text in saying he has a, a problem with his microphone. Okay, okay. Uh -huh. yeah. Okay. But maybe he can, maybe he can write <laughs> the question in or something if he has one. <clears throat> yeah, I think it's a very special opportunity for us. Uh, although we are on the, the different side of the planet, but I think uh, we're really close to your thinking. And there's wonderful research. And uh, I think we want to share it to more people. And uh, looking forward to read your book. And, uh, yeah. Well, I think that the, the timber the timber book could be a good follow up because it's a it is one of the the kind of contemporary techniques methods materials that I use where you can see a really you know productive you know relationship between thinking about like in this case the building and the forest and so there's a lot to add there you know this is I think good from a historical perspective to analyze something that a building that we all know well um, but. Um, Okay, so here he has a question in on the brass. Um, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, talk more a little bit more about why the craftsman, um, why it needs to be made straight. So um, when, you know, when they're pressing, um, they're just basically pounding uh, that brass billet, which is just a round, you know, cylinder into those long 26 foot long mullions. They go through a whole series of dies uh, kind of giving it, taking it, you know, extruding it from that billet, from that cylinder into those, those mullions. And each one of those steps, they're just, they're just pulling it through a machine and pushing it through a machine with, with, you know, that pneumatic hammer. And every time that pneumatic, pneumatic hammer hits the brass, which isn't that strong as a, as a metal, it gets deformed and like it gets, it gets shaped. Uh, but it doesn't come through perfectly smooth and evenly through that process. It's a really brutal physical process to, you know, transform that metal cylinder into that, that kind of beautiful shape. Um, so when, when it comes out of, of the, um, let's see, go all the way back. Um, I'll try and find the photo here, but um, it comes out and it's very irregular. It's all bent and warped and everything like that. So to um, uh, to get it back to, I don't see the image popping up, but uh, to get it into um, something that looks like the Seagram building or what Mies would find acceptable, it has to be um, hand tapped. Um, there it is. This is what they look like when they come out and you can see that they're kind of uneven they're not really perpendicular they're not you know kind of the kind of eye shaped um, that you would want um, it has that general shape but they're not straight you can see they're curving and they're twisted and everything like that it's almost like a you know architects always draw a rectangle for a piece of wood and a piece of wood is is never straight, right? It's always curved and twisted and everything like that. Well, that's that's very much the case with these brass mullions as well. That uh, when they come out of that machine process, they're they're twisted and cupped and and curved, uh, and so somebody has to straighten them out um, to make them the beautiful, you know, kind of orthographic building that that Mies and his his architects drew. Yeah. Great. Okay, I think 
um, it's almost uh, the time. And uh, I would like to, to show a great thanks to uh, Kumo and uh, it's a wonderful and remarkable lecture. Uh, I think uh, all of us learning a lot from, from him. So thank you so much for your contribution to our platform and to the uh, doctor consortium. So looking forward to uh, invite you uh, in the near future to give us some new interesting research and, and uh, thanks for your coming. Uh, have a good night to you and have a good day to all the students uh, on the platform. Thank you, thank you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye-bye.